We all strive to live a long, prosperous, and healthy life. With advances in health and medical sciences, this goal is ever more attainable. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is a nonprofit organized research unit under the auspices of the University of California at San Diego, committed to advancing lifelong health and independence through research, education, and patient care. To better empower and improve the lives of young and old alike, the Stein Institute presents the following program. Well, good evening, everyone. I see a lot of fresh faces here. That's so good to see. Thank you for coming. My name is Jody De La Pena Murphy, and I'm the Community Relations Director for the Stein Institute for Research on Aging. So we're very, very honored to have Dr. Weinreb here tonight. He is a clinician, a surgeon, and a scientist. He oversees all of the clinical aspects of glaucoma diagnosis and treatment within the Department of Ophthalmology at the Shiley Eye Center, and patients from throughout the world seek his diagnostic and surgical expertise. Dr. Weinreb is a distinguished professor of ophthalmology here at the UCSD School of Medicine, and he's also the director of the Hamilton Glaucoma Center, which provides state-of-the-art laboratory and clinical research facilities for glaucoma, glaucoma excuse me, and a home for a world-renowned team of 60 scientists and staff. Dr. Weinreb graduated from the Harvard Medical School and has trained more than 110 postdoctoral fellows in glaucoma, many of whom hold distinguished positions all over the United, or all over the, throughout the world. He's a prolific researcher and writer with more than 1,000 scientific publications and 15 books. He has received numerous awards and has been cited in every edition of Woodward White, The Best Doctors in America. He is president of the American Glaucoma Society and the past president of the World Glaucoma Association and the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Weinberg. Well, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank Jody and the Stein Institute for Research in Aging for the invitation to speak this evening. Uh, during the past 25 years, I've made it a habit of annually having the opportunity to talk to my patients about glaucoma. It provides me with an opportunity to update everyone on what's happening in glaucoma, provide them with some information about what is glaucoma and the scope of the problem and how we treat it. So the topic this evening is dancing through the darkness of glaucoma. And what I'd like to talk about is how glaucoma affects different individuals, how you can prevent it, how you can treat it. But first, I want to tell you a little about the problem. Let's begin by talking about blindness. And many of you know about the fear of blindness. And I don't need to tell you that for many individuals, the fear of blindness is greater than the fear for any other medical condition, including heart disease and even premature death. The fear of blindness is significant. Let me tell you about how glaucoma can affect eyesight. This is a photograph that I took about 15 years ago of two young children who are outside playing. This is a, what a healthy individual would see. The children are happy. You can see them holding some balls that they're playing with. You see the fence behind them. It's a clear day. Let's talk about some other eye conditions that you might have heard about that affect the aging individual. Cataract. All of you heard about cataract. Cataract is an opacification or a clouding of the clear lens within the eye that occurs in virtually everyone as they age. A cataract 
dims vision throughout the entire visual field. Cataract is a treatable condition. With modern surgical techniques, you can remove the cataract and in its place have a clear plastic lens that restores clear vision. Cataract is one of the leading causes of decreased vision in the aged. Another decreased cause of vision, and one that you've heard a lot about recently, is a condition known as age-related macular degeneration. This affects the inner film in the eye known as the retina. The type of vision loss that one's experience with age-related macular degeneration is typically central vision loss. In fact, many patients with age-related macular degeneration have very clear peripheral vision. And many of you have heard about this because you have friends, you have family who have this condition. And there are a number of new treatments for age-related macular degeneration. Again, a common cause of blindness in the aged population. Glaucoma is distinct from cataract. It's distinct from age-related macular degeneration. These are some comments that I've heard from patients through the years that might give you an idea of the scope of vision loss associated with glaucoma. How are you doing today? Well, I had a problem bumping into things and had a fall on the stairs. How's your vision? Another patient might say, I can't see very well. It just gets worse very slowly and it never gets better. And still another patient might respond, I wasn't really aware of my vision trouble. I could still read the paper, but it's more difficult to get about. And still another patient might say something like, I lost my driving license, and unfortunately I have to rely on others more than I like. These are the types of comments that I hear from patients every day. And these are the types of comments that many of you are familiar with. Well, unlike cataract that affects and blurs vision and is treatable and curable, glaucoma typically affects the peripheral vision first. Peripheral vision is known as the side vision. And what that means is typically a patient with glaucoma can see what's in front of them very clearly, but it's the side vision that's affected. And this presents the greatest problem for patients with glaucoma because the central vision is intact. Many patients with glaucoma don't even recognize that they have the condition until late in the course of the disease. As glaucoma worsens, the peripheral vision also deteriorates. And as the peripheral vision deteriorates, it begins to affect the central vision. And when it begins to affect central vision is when patients begin to notice it. By the time a patient notices that there's something wrong with their glaucoma, in many situations, it's very late in the course of their disease. So glaucoma is very different from the other leading causes of blindness in the elderly. Because with cataract and age-related macular degeneration, there's blurring of vision that occurs very early. And one can typically seek medical care. In contrast, with glaucoma, there often is no vision loss until it's very late in the course of the disease. 
Glaucoma is common, and I'm going to show you how common it is. It's distressing. Many patients, when they hear that they have glaucoma and that they learn that they have a chronic condition typically associated with aging, they're very distressed. And glaucoma can be disabling. Well, why is glaucoma so common and why is it increasing in frequency? Well, here's a graphic that depicts what's happening to the population over a period of time. And it shows no matter what age group you look at in the elderly, whether you're looking at greater than 85 years old, which is bottom here, whether you're looking at group of patients in the decade from 75 years old to 84, 65 years old to 74, or even 40 to 64, our population is aging. As we get older, we're going to have more of the conditions associated with aging, including glaucoma. Well, the global prevalence, not only here, but everywhere in the world, is increasing due to the rapid growth of the aging population. As much as 90% of glaucoma is undiagnosed. In the United States, we estimate that at least 50% of glaucoma is undiagnosed. That means for every patient who has glaucoma, who know they have glaucoma, there's at least one other patient who has glaucoma who does not know that they have glaucoma. It's a staggering number when you think about it. And when you go overseas, when you go to Asia, or when you go to parts of Europe or Africa, it can be as high as 90% of the individuals who have glaucoma don't know that they have it. In 2008, there's no question that when you lose vision from glaucoma, it can greatly impact your individual independence. And that's one of the reasons that patients are fearful of losing vision from glaucoma. They're fearful that they will lose their independence. The good news is that glaucoma, when it's diagnosed early and when it's treated appropriately, in almost all cases, can be successfully treated and you can prevent vision loss. Well, how common is glaucoma? Here's the best estimates we have for the year 2010, which is right around the corner. We estimate that worldwide there will be 100 million individuals who have glaucoma. 100 million individuals with glaucoma. Of those 100 individual, million individuals, it's estimated that about 1 in 10 will be blind. It's about 10 million. And interestingly, because women live longer, women are disproportionately affected by glaucoma. In the year 2020, we see that the number of individuals with glaucoma is increasing. Our best estimates are that there'll be 120 million individuals. And that of that 120 million individuals, again, one in 10 will be blind from glaucoma. That's about 12 million individuals worldwide blind from glaucoma. Clearly, this is a very significant problem. It has important public health implications, and it has important personal implications as well. 
Well, I've told you how common glaucoma is, and I've given you an idea of the scope of the problem. What I'd like to do next is talk about what is glaucoma. Glaucoma, by many individuals, is thought to be a disease of high eye pressure. During the past decade, we've learned that rather than thinking about glaucoma as a disease of eye pressure, that you should think about it as a disease of the optic nerve. The optic nerve is damaged in glaucoma. And it's damaged in many patients because there's a susceptibility to the eye pressure. One of the common questions that I'm asked by my patients is, how high is too high? And there's no magic number. The answer is, any eye pressure that can damage the optic nerve is too high. Some people have damage to their optic nerve at a very low eye pressure. And others, for reasons that we don't know, even when their eye pressure is very, very high, they don't seem to have damage. Along with the optic nerve damage, we can have vision loss. And again, the vision loss doesn't typically occur early in the course of the disease. It occurs as the disease progresses. Here's a diagram of the eye in cross-section. On the right, we have the clear cornea. In purple, you can see the iris. The iris is the colored part of the eye. Most of us have brown eyes. Some of us have blue or hazel eyes. Sitting behind the iris is the lens. And it's that lens, incidentally, that gets cloudy when you have a cataract. The lens is responsible for focusing the light on the back of the eye. And the inside of the eye is lined by a film known as the retina. And within the retina, there are many nerve cells. There's about a million nerve cells, each of which has a nerve fiber. And those nerve fibers converge at the back of the eye, and they leave the eye via a structure known as the optic nerve. The optic nerve is the cable that transmits the visual message from the eye to the brain. Here's another diagram. The cornea is in front, and here's the optic nerve. And again, those fibers are extensions of the nerve cells within the retina of the inside of the eye. And they pass out of the eye. These fibers are conducting electrical signals and chemical signals away from the eye and to the eye. They're like a highway with traffic going in both directions. And in order to pass out of the eye, they need to pass through a little structure depicted here in green known as the lamina cribrosa. And that's the toll keeper. That's what controls the traffic. Well, let me show you how we think intraocular pressure affects the optic nerve. So here's the optic nerve in cross-section. It looks like a telephone cable. There's about a million fibers here in cross-section, and they're organized in bundles. As glaucoma progresses, the nerve fibers are damaged, 
and there's less nerve fibers over time. Now where does the optic nerve go? The optic nerve leaves the eye and it actually, half of the fibers cross over to the other side and connect to the brain stem, the lower part of the brain. And in the brain, there's a little relay station in the brain stem and then there's a series of new nerve fibers that connect to the visual cortex in the brain. The visual message is transmitted via the nerve fibers to the brain stem and into the visual cortex in the brain. If anything happens in this pathway, then there's going to be no visual signal and you won't be able to see. So what damages the optic nerve in glaucoma? This is the nerve cell in the retina. I mentioned that there's about a million of them. The technical name for the nerve cell is the retinal ganglion cell. And the retinal ganglion cell has little extensions that form the one million optic nerve fibers. Now the retinal ganglion cell, or the nerve cell, has a conversation with the brain stem, the lower part of the brain, which is where it makes its first connection. And as I mentioned, part of that conversation are electrical signals that result from light stimulating the nerve cell, and part of that conversation is from chemical signals. And it's a two-way conversation. The retinal ganglion cell in the eye is talking to the brain stem. The brain stem is sending signals to the retinal ganglion cell. The retinal ganglion cell is sending signals through the toll keeper, the lamina cribrosa, to the brain stem. And that's what happens in a healthy eye. And these signals nourish the nerve cells in the retina and in the brain stem. And when the signals are going back and forth and the conversation is a very active conversation, then the nerve cells are healthy. And the vision is good. Now I mentioned in the brain stem, the nerve fibers, it's a little relay station and the fibers then connect to the brain. So the brain stem has a conversation with the brain. And again, in a healthy individual, there's nothing blocking that. Well, what happens in glaucoma? Well, in glaucoma, as the result of intraocular pressure, and again, there's no magic number. Some people it's low, some people it's high. Something happens and the nerve fibers are compressed as they leave the eye. And they're typically compressed at the little toll station, the lamina cribrosa. So instead of having the signals flowing back and forth as you would in a healthy eye, the signals from the lateral geniculate nucleus or the brain stem get blocked at the lamina cribrosa and they can no longer nourish the nerve cells. And the signals from the retina to the brain are also blocked. So the nerve cells in the retina and the nerve cells in the brain stem begin to die. Now, is eye pressure the only factor that damages the optic nerve in glaucoma. Well, increasingly we appreciate that there are a large number of factors in addition to the eye pressure. Some of them relate to things such as blood flow and your circulation. For example, recently 
it's been discovered that people who have very low blood pressure at nighttime are going to be more susceptible to glaucoma. The most common reason people have low blood pressure at nighttime is due to overtreatment of their high blood pressure. They take medicines to treat their high blood pressure, and the blood pressure gets very low during the nighttime. There are other factors as well, as well, relating to the blood flow that can damage the retinal ganglion cell, the nerve cell. Another group of factors that are thought to damage the optic nerve in glaucoma relate to those associated with your immune condition. There are a variety of different types of immunity in the body. In some patients with glaucoma, there seems to be something wrong with the immune system. And this is a very exciting area of research because in those individuals, it may be able to treat glaucoma with a vaccine that can boost the immunity. Another group of factors that can be affected relate to the cells in the retina that are not nerve cells. They make a lot of chemical signals that can damage the nerve cell independent of the eye pressure. And then there are factors relating to something called oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is something that can occur when there's little oxygen compared to what is needed for a cell to be healthy. And I'll say a little more about that shortly. Well, on the left, you can see a healthy optic nerve and cross-section. I mentioned there's about a million nerve fibers. Actually, there's a lot of variation in the nerve fibers, too. There are some individuals that are born with about 600 or 700,000 nerve fibers. And there are others that are born with about 1.6 million nerve fibers. But as glaucoma progresses, you lose nerve fibers. And as you lose nerve fibers, look what happens to the optic nerve. It begins to shrink. It begins to shrink. So here you've lost more than 50% of your nerve fibers. Interestingly, for many patients, if they do the standard visual field test to detect glaucoma, even when you've lost 50% of the nerve fibers, the test might be normal. And that's why we have to look at the back of the eye and we do all kinds of other tests, imaging, to try to document what's happening to the optic nerve. You can lose up to 50% of your nerve fibers and have a normal visual field. So the visual field test isn't the best test for detecting glaucoma. As glaucoma progresses, you can lose almost all your nerve fibers. In this case, more than 90% of your nerve fibers. And this person, who's lost almost 90% of their nerve fibers, is someone who only has a small island, central island of vision remaining. They've lost almost all their peripheral vision. Well, I mentioned to you that glaucoma is not just a disease of the eye. Here on the left, you can see a diagram showing the optic nerve and how it connects to the brain. And I mentioned to you about this conversation between the nerve cells in the eye and the nerve cells in the brain. Well, if that conversation is blocked, the nerve cells in the eye die but the nerve cells in the brain also die. And using some very sophisticated imaging and functional techniques known as functional magnetic resonance imaging and magnetic resonance imaging, we now can show that many patients, virtually all patients with glaucoma, have not just a disease of the eye, 
but a disease of the entire central nervous system, including the brain. So I talked about the scope of glaucoma. I talked about what damages the optic nerve in glaucoma. I'm going to say something about the vision loss of glaucoma. I mentioned to you that it typically starts in the periphery. And as glaucoma worsens, it begins to encroach on the central vision. So instead of seeing you know, this entire field of view here, you can see that you, only the, the, the kids are seen centrally, but you can no longer see the fence. You can imagine if you're walking across the street and a car is coming at you from the side, how you might not see it. Or if you're driving a car and someone makes a bad turn, how you might not see it if you've lost your peripheral vision. The vision loss associated with glaucoma is silent because it affects the peripheral vision or side vision first. It's slow. It's slow. Glaucoma damage typically doesn't occur after weeks or months. It typically occurs after years. It's progressive. If untreated, if untreated, virtually all patients with glaucoma have progressive loss of vision. And it's irreversible. Irreversible means that once you've lost your optic nerve fibers, once you've lost your optic nerve fibers, you're not going to get back those optic nerve fibers. So the goal of treatment is to preserve the nerve fibers that remain. Incidentally, in 2008, it's not reversible. But in the future, there's great optimism that it will be reversible and that we'll be able to treat the optic nerve. And in particular, I want to mention the use of stem cells. Stem cells have great potential for replacing the dead nerve fibers and the dead nerve cells. Well, what are the goals of treatment? The primary goal of our treatment today is to reduce the eye pressure. It doesn't matter what your eye pressure is. If you have glaucoma, the treatment is to lower it. And typically, we lower it from the maximal amount that we've identified by taking the pressure in the office. Someone who has mild disease, we might want to lower it 20 to 30 percent. And somebody who has bad disease, our target might be 50 percent or more less than the highest eye pressure. <coughs> eye pressure in 2008 is the only modifiable factor that we can treat. Our goal by lowering the eye pressure is to slow the damage to the optic nerve. And if we lower eye pressure sufficiently, we do slow the damage. Now, we cannot eliminate the damage completely, but we can slow it sufficiently so it should never, ever be a problem. And by slowing the optic nerve damage, a third goal is to preserve the visual field. And then finally, by preserving the visual field, the goal of treatment is to preserve quality of life. So what are some of the keys to preserving vision loss? Well, timely diagnosis and appropriate treatment through regular, complete, eye examinations. The purpose of glaucoma treatment is to allow a patient
to carry on as normal a life as possible and to control the effects of glaucoma. Well, it sounds simple. If it's so simple, why are there 10 million individuals blind from glaucoma? Why is the diagnosis and treatment delayed? Well, glaucoma is painless in most situations. Actually, glaucoma is a group of diseases. There's not one type of glaucoma. There's maybe a hundred different types of glaucoma. And most of them are painless. The visual symptoms, what a patient actually notices, are late. I mentioned earlier that you could lose 50% of your nerve fibers and not be able to even detect any loss of vision. When glaucoma is diagnosed, vision loss occurs in only 50% of the newly diagnosed, which means that 50% haven't even noticed there's anything wrong with their vision. It's very difficult to know that you have glaucoma, and so most patients don't actually seek care for glaucoma until it's too late. Who's at risk? And this is critical to preventing vision loss. And it's also perhaps the most significant reason why patients go blind from glaucoma and fail to be diagnosed and treated. It's because elderly individuals think that deteriorating vision is part of growing old. They think that their deteriorating vision is part of growing old. And in fact, as you get older, there shouldn't be much age-related loss of vision. But most individuals just think it's part of growing old, very much like the back aches, the headaches, the changes in your skin, the changes in, that occur as you get older. Well, how do you prevent glaucoma? Well, first is to learn the risk factors of glaucoma. The leading risk factor is high eye pressure. The higher the eye pressure, the more likely one is to develop glaucoma. The higher the eye pressure, the more likely to get glaucoma. Nearsightedness. The more nearsighted you are, the more likely you are to have glaucoma. The most common type of glaucoma in this country is associated with a large amount of nearsightedness. In China, it's a bit different, because in China, there's a different type of glaucoma that is more common than the type that we have here. And in China, not only being nearsighted, but also being farsighted is a risk factor for the other major type of glaucoma. Family history. Family history is perhaps as big a risk factor as high eye pressure. If you have an immediate relative with glaucoma, which means a parent, a child, or a sibling, a brother or sister, you're several fo fold more likely to develop glaucoma or have glaucoma. Individuals of African descent, Asian individuals and individuals with high blood pressure are all individuals who have significant risk factors for glaucoma. The key message here is that if you have a risk factor, you should go and see your eye doctor. Well, how often should you see them? Well, in general, we recommend 
that if you're 40 years or older, you should be seeing them at least every two years if you have one of these risk factors. If you're 60 years old, you should be seeing your eye doctor annually. Individuals whose pressure is very high or have a lot of relatives who have glaucoma, as an example, or are very nearsighted, should also be seeing their eye doctor every year. And when you have an eye examination, it's not sufficient to measure the eye pressure. It's essential that you have an examination by an eye doctor who's skilled at examining the optic nerve. So you need a complete eye examination with an eye pressure test and an optic nerve examination. The best chance of preserving vision over a lifetime is to diagnose it early and appropriate treatment. And if it's diagnosed late, the best chance of preserving vision over a lifetime is to have it appropriately treated. So why do you need regular exams? Well, glaucoma has no early symptoms. You're just not aware of it. People have glaucoma and they don't know it. And over half of all glaucoma cases in the United States are undiagnosed. And I mentioned around the world it's as high as 90 percent of glaucoma cases are undiagnosed. Glaucoma damage and vision loss is not reversible, which means you want to pick it up as early as you can and treat it to prevent it from getting worse. And glaucoma may lead to blindness if untreated or if inadequately treated. The converse of that is that one can preserve vision if it's diagnosed, treated, and appropriately treated. So the best chance of preserving vision is early diagnosis. And if you have glaucoma, the best chance of preserving vision is appropriate treatment. So when I look into my crystal ball, I mentioned a number of factors that can damage the nerve cells in the eye. But I, and I mentioned that the eye pressure is the only modifiable factor today. You lower eye pressure because it's the only thing we know how to treat. But I see a number of other factors that are looming on the horizon that might actually be modifiable and allow us to preserve vision more effectively. Smoking. Smoking looks like it's going to be very bad for glaucoma, just like it is for many other conditions associated with aging. And if you have glaucoma and you're a smoker, my recommendation is to stop smoking. Diet and obesity. Certain types of diets look like they might be protective. And we've learned a lot of this from our, the, the, the studies that have been done over decades in coronary heart disease. The same types of diets that are effective for preventing coronary heart disease are most likely the same types of diets that are going to be most effective for preserving vision with glaucoma. Obesity. There are changes in the body, in the chemical constituents in the body associated with obesity that also may have an adverse effect on glaucoma. And there's no question, in my mind, that weight loss of an obese individual who has glaucoma is going to help the disease. And then finally, exercise. Exercise is great. You know, as you get older, it, it's good for your heart, it's good for your lungs, it's good for your brain, and it's also great for your optic nerve. It can lower your eye pressure, it can enhance the circulation, and the blood flow to your optic nerve, and I suspect it's going to be protective of glaucoma progression. How much exercise? My recommendation are the same types of recommendations that have been made for individuals with cardiovascular disease and any 
elderly individual should have regular exercise. Well, here's the future. This is a composite of the retina, an optic nerve, that we took in the laboratory. This is the optic nerve here. These shadows are blood vessels. And the little dots are fluorescent dots. And each one is a nerve cell. This happens to be the retina of a mouse. And it's a mouse that's been genetically engineered so that the nerve cells in the retina are very bright. Well, how are we going to protect them? I mentioned one of the things that we think is damaging the optic nerve is oxidative stress. It turns out that all the nerve cells, like other cells in the body, have an energy source within them. And the energy source is called mitochondria. It's like the battery. It's what gives you the energy of the cells to process their nutrients and to be healthy. And in glaucoma, we've identified changes now experimentally that show that as you raise pressure in the laboratory, we can see that there's damage to the optic nerve fibers associated with a loss of energy by the cells because of impairment of these batteries known as the mitochondria. And I think this is a very promising therapeutic avenue for future research and clinical research and something that might be effective in the future for treating glaucoma along with lowering eye pressure. Well, what are some of the things that you can do to sort of recharge your batteries? And incidentally, changes in the mitochondria, in this, in this battery, are, are not unique to glaucoma. They're often found with coronary heart disease. They're found with other neurologic conditions. They're found with all kinds of conditions associated with aging. There are a number of drugs that are being studied now that actually recharge the batteries. But there are some things that are also known to recharge the batteries that you can avail yourself of today. One of those is a substance known as resveratrol. Resveratrol is a chemical that's found in many different types of foods. For example, it's found in grapes. Grapes. It's also found in wine, particularly red wine. Many of you have heard about the French paradox. The French paradox. The French eat a lot of fatty foods. And they just don't seem to have the coronary heart disease that we have in this country. And for a long time, nobody knew why. And over the past several years, it's been demonstrated fairly clearly that there's an association between drinking red wine and lack of coronary heart disease. And it looks like the common denominator here is going to be the resveratrol in the red wine. You know, the French drink red wine for lunch. They drink it for dinner. Some of them drink it for breakfast. <laughs> What's very interesting is there's another way you can recharge your batteries. It's not something that most of us can avail ourselves of. It's called caloric restriction. Caloric restriction. What that means is cutting down the amount of calories that you have. Well, how much? It's been shown in virtually all experimental animals, including the primate, that if you reduce your caloric intake by 30% or more, there's an association with longevity. You live longer. If a monkey eats less, he lives longer. If a mouse <coughs> eats less, she lives longer. Most likely, 
if we're capable of eating less, we'll live longer too. It's just not practical to do that. The common denominator is a group of substances in the body known as the sirtuins. The sirtuins are substances that increase in the presence of resveratrol. They're increased when there's caloric restriction. And they appear to be substances that recharge the batteries. They affect the mitochondria directly. And these are now being studied in clinical trials for diseases like diabetes and Alzheimer's. And hopefully soon, we'll have clinical trials of them in glaucoma as well. Well, I wanted to sort of whet your appetite with the future of glaucoma treatment and talk a little about resveratrol and where we might be going. I want to summarize now what I've talked about this evening. So glaucoma is common. It's distressing. It's disabling. 50% of patients who have glaucoma in the United States are undiagnosed. Glaucoma unquestionably affects quality of life. A third of our population fears blindness, and we fear blindness more than we fear almost anything else. The delayed diagnosis of glaucoma increases the risk of disability. And ultimately, the timely diagnosis and appropriate treatment through regular, complete eye examinations and taking your medications that have been prescribed if you have glaucoma can preserve quality of life and maintain independence. So with that, I'd like to, uh, I'll open it up for questions. I'd like to acknowledge and thank the outstanding team that I have at the Hamilton Glaucoma Center. Here are some of the faculty in our group, many of whom I've worked with for 20 years or, or longer, and, and as well as the staff. It's a unique, unique group working in what is the only dedicated glaucoma research facility in the world. So let's have some questions. We have time for questions? Please go ahead. An optic nerve examination requires a number of different components. First of all, uh, you need a clinical exam, which requires a dilated exam, which means your pupil needs to be dilated. And using a handheld lens at a microscope, known as a slit lamp, an, an eye doctor could look in the back of the eye and get an idea of the three-dimensional view of the optic nerve. Glaucoma has a characteristic appearance in which there's an excavation of the optic nerve because of the loss of fibers. During the past decade, we've had the opportunity not only to examine the optic nerve in the clinic, but we have specialized tools that will allow us to image certain features of the optic nerve. One instrument, for example, measures the thickness of the retinal nerve fibers. Another one gives us a computerized, automatic, three-dimensional topographic map of the optic disc. The future of imaging of the optic nerve is very bright because I think we're going to be able to count the nerve cells and count the nerve fibers and very sensitively be able to determine whether someone has glaucoma, whether they're progressing, and whether our treatments are effective. Question. With early detection, what are some of the treatments? Well, initially, the treatment is to lower eye pressure. And in the past, we've done it typically with a series of eye drops. And 
you know, the, the eye is like a sink. There's a faucet and there's a drain. And if you want to regulate the pressure in the eye and lower it, you can turn off the faucet or you can open up the drain. So the medications that we use are medications that either turn off the faucet or open up the drain. And typically we begin with a group of drugs that open up the drain. And then we might add some eye drops as well that turn off the faucet. The medications that we have today are more effective than they've ever been. They're safer, but each of the medications that we use has the potential for side effects, either locally at the eye, such as irritation or redness, or throughout the rest of the body, including effects on the heart rate, on general feeling tired, or even slowing down brain function. Over the past decade, increasingly people are being treated with laser surgery very early, in some cases instead of eye drops. Laser surgery is safe, it's effective, it doesn't work in everybody. The side effects are virtually negligible. Uh, it's painless. And as I think as we move forward, we'll probably need to do a study that looks at the use of laser treatment compared with eye drop treatment uh, initially for glaucoma. As glaucoma worsens, we add eye drops or we might add laser surgery. But some patients can't tolerate the eye drops or they're not effective. And in those patients, more conventional surgery is needed. And with more conventional surgery, we have a number of options, including using a microscope to place a very tiny hole, a microscopic hole in the outer coat of the eye to drain the fluid and lower the eye pressure. And in some cases, might even put in a little tube to lower the eye pressure. There are surgical treatments are more effective than they've ever been but still need considerable improvement so that they could be even more effective and safer for our patients. So once again, I'd like to thank the Stein Institute for the invitation to uh, join you this evening. And, uh, and I look forward in the future to talking with you again and being able to address any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.